any tradition of uh, doing these shout outs from uh, as close to the sea as I can get. Uh, here's to the team of the Cockle Shell Atlantic Endeavour. Congratulations on cracking the Atlantic Ocean. Phenomenal. In the true tradition of Royal Marines. Gentlemen, how are you? Good. Yeah, very well, thank you. Yeah, very, very well, thanks. Good, well, thanks. That was nice and measured, so we didn't all talk over the top of each other. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell these guys are professionals. So, friends at home, it's my absolute delight today to host my fellow bootnecks. Um, as... Uh, Many of you would have seen we've had Mick Dawson on the show and we've had Lee Spencer on the show, both um, rowing, ocean rowing legends. And now I've got Junior, Nutty, Brucey and Will, who have just rowed from Canaria, Grand Canaria, to, was it, was it Barbados, fellas? Yeah. And... Your expedition was called the Cockle Shell Endeavour. Have, have I got that right? Yeah. Okay, so if we go with Will, can you just explain for our friends at home, Will, why, why the term Cockle Shell is so um, relevant to the Royal Marines? Um, well, it's named after the Cockle Shell heroes, um, who obviously did the, the daring raid in, in, in the World War. And... Um, yeah, I guess because it was a um, amphibious expedition, it just seemed natural to to name to name it after the famous bootnecks. Yeah, so they were commandos, weren't they, in the, in the Second World War? Yeah, and was it ten or twelve went behind enemy lines in the cockle shell kayak or canoe, and eight of them lost their lives and it was tragic like literally one of the canoes cap cap capsized chap had to hold on to the back of another canoe as long as he could and then they just turned around and said fella you got to try and swim and of course they they knew they knew these guys wouldn't make it then some were uh executed by the germans when they were caught and only um only two made it back to to the UK is am I am I roughly about right there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yes. Um, and Bill Sparks, I think, was a oh Bill Bill <clears throat> ripe old age, didn't he? And still still enjoyed a pint pint with the guys, but he was one of the the chaps that made it back. Um, yes, what a what what a bloody commitment these men were prepared to make hey yeah when i um ran the length of the country um one of the women that came to meet me was a photographer and she um she was called hazel by the way hello hazel her uncle was one of the chaps that died in that raid so um one at a time, if we start my top left, which is junior, do you want to give us a quick um, overview of your service? I'm junior. Uh, I joined the Royal Marines in 2007. Um, <clears throat> shortly after passing out of training, I deployed to Afghanistan on my first tour. 
um, at Herrick Nine in 2008, um, which was a yeah, it was a bit of an eye opener for me. Um, didn't know really what to expect, but uh, yeah, the first the first day we got ambushed, pretty kinetic, kinetic, um, pretty busy, and um, yeah, it was a steep learning curve. Um, after returning, after returning home from Herrick Nine, had a bit of time off, deployed on um, upper, uh, upper exercise Riga uh, to the States, which is pretty cool, working over there. Um, shortly after returning from the States, we were um, getting ready for Herrick 14 and started pre-deployment trading again. Um, yeah, so then uh, deployed on my second tour in 2011 with Will in, in J Company this time. My first first time was with Lima Company at 4-2. Second time was J Company 4-2. Um, but it was, com- it was completely, we were doing a completely different thing to my first tour. Um, first tour, we we're doing strike ops. And this tour, we we're doing like routine, more routine patrols. Um yeah, uh, three months into that tour, uh, uh, yeah, I was um, caught up in an explosion. I was uh, top, I was top cover on a mastiff on the GMG. We got struck by a pretty large IED. Um, yeah, so severely injuring um, every everyone really, uh, but luckily, luckily no deaths. Um, we were, we were, yeah, we were uh, sort of. Uh, security for this board of army officers going around doing serial checks that day and all the army officers in the rear of the vehicle they were quite bad quite severely injured um, myself i was ejected from the vehicle um landed back on the vehicle with a with a turret system on top of me which is pretty heavy um but yeah then uh that, that i was flown back to bastion uh they were preparing me to fly back to the uk um straight away but I, I kicked off a bit of a fuss and said I, I would make a recovery in a week or so out in Afghanistan. So it, they kept me out in Afghanistan for two two or three weeks. I was out there um, while the rest of the lads were flown back within the first 24 hours. But, um, yeah, they kept me out there and I wasn't wasn't really making a recovery at all. Um, couldn't really walk properly at the time. And, uh, yeah, I was flown back to flown back to England where I started my rehab at 4-2 Commando in uh, oh, I forgot what it was, in Kango Troop. Uh, I was then lucky enough to be selected to go to another uh, specialist rehabilitation unit called Hasler Company at the time where they um, where a lot of inj- Royal Marines went. Um, yeah. Uh, and then after a few years of rehab in Hasler Company, I was, I was medically discharged Um since leaving, I've, I've done a bit of security work, a bit of other work as well. But uh, I was really unhappy. Um, so I quit my security job and and then started going on expeditions, on kayak and expeditions, canoeing expeditions, climbing expeditions, um, do a lot of skiing, so go skiing two, three times a year. And, uh, and then I was offered this chance to um, to row the Atlantic by Brucey and Nutty, which I said yes to straight away. Knew I had no idea what it was going to entail, even though I'm, I'm good friends with Frank, uh, Frank Spencer, Lee Spencer, and uh, but still, uh, still until till I experienced it, it I could hear, I was listening to his stories, but until I experienced it myself, um, d- didn't really know what it was going to feel like. But yeah. Um, yeah, so since leaving, um, yeah, uh, I, I wasn't happy. Still always looking to find more happiness and adventure. Um, and the Ocean Row was amazing. And I, and I think it's something every bootneck should want to try and do at some point. I think it was amazing, amazing experience. Junior, yeah. for someone like me, right, I, I'm, I, love, I love adventuring. I love expeditions. Um, but I have a son now. And I, I have this moral sort of dilemma in my head about, like, if I was to get on an Everest expedition or if I was to row the Atlantic, would I be taking an unnecessary 
risk, meaning well, could, could I fucking die, you know? Mm. Um, well, how is it when you're actually, I mean, when Lee was on the show, he said he had 40 foot waves and he was, t- mm. he, was he was terrified. And I watched that documentary about the canoer who tried to canoe from, was it Tasmania to New Zealand or, or, yeah. or, or some, something like that? Yeah. He got within 10 miles of land and all his family and kids were there waiting for him to come in. He didn't come in. And he just, they heard something on the radio, but they didn't know. He's going, I'm the canoer, I'm the canoer. Yeah. And they didn't know what who the canoer was, but that was him yeah. t- taking his last breaths, basically. Um, yeah. Can you just enlighten us about that and basically tell yeah. me to go anyway? Yeah, uh- yeah, I think there's a lot of risk and a, a lot of things that a lot of people do. Um, but for some reason, my head, uh, I know that the risk could be losing your life and a lot of things we've all done in the past. But, I've, yeah, I've never, I, I, I don't have any kids that have any wife. I've never really been, yeah, in a committed relationship whenever I've gone away on operations or on expeditions. Um, and, and I'd, yeah, and I just... Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's the whole fr- thrill, really, as well. Mm. And there were moments on the road where I was absolutely terrified. Um, yeah, the first, we, we left on the first day, got hit, but it was a beautiful day, flat, calm, a couple of hours into the road. Um, all, it, it was just like hell on earth. It was disgusting. And that lasted a good few days. So I was kind of terrified at the beginning then, but it built my confidence within the boat and within our capabilities. Uh, and there was a couple of other moments during the row where I was terrified, but that, that moment passed, and I think I get like get a buzz, I get a buzz of that. But again, if I did have a family back at home, I think it'd be a complete different experience for me. But I don't, and um, I think in the moments where I'm terrified, I sort of em- embrace it and feel it, and then when that moment pass passes, it's just I think it's just a good a good bit and um a bit of a rush as well so yeah so maybe come on to one of the other guys let's go to will so will if if you were capsized right out there in the middle of the atlantic what i i I mean are you um what's the word you know hooked up to the boat is it is it a chance a a passing ship's going to come and get you can you can you get the 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 boat righted uh can a helicopter get can you just fill us in on that sort of stuff yeah well we were um we were always clipped onto the boat at all times whenever we were on deck so when we were changing over we'd always make sure we're like clipping onto the the safety line um so we'd obviously be wearing a life jacket or we had um we had little like climbing harnesses which we took the leg loops out so we're just using the belt um and yeah, if we if we did capsize, that um, hopefully all being well, the, the boat would would self right itself. Um, but you know, it's not a hundred percent guaranteed, depending on what you know what's going on and stuff. Um, if it didn't, then then the two guys that are on the deck would still be clipped on, so they'd be able to get to the boat, stand on top, and use use the uh, the lines we had on the deck to, to hopefully pull it back over with the assistance of the lads who are in the cabins if we can you know communicate with them um it would obviously have to be a bit of a team effort to get it back um but you know if it wasn't i guess like worst case scenario it d- didn't self right and we couldn't get it back over then um you know we had we had epurbs um which uh, we'd, ha- we'd have to set off and then they'd get a, you know, we'd have to put out a mayday. Um, and, you know, hopefully there would have been a vessel nearby or, you know, it could, we could have been waiting a long time for for rescue, um, depending on whereabouts we were and where whereabouts other vessels were. Um, but, yeah, there are safety procedures in place for every scenario, I guess. It's a big difference being in a team of being on your own as well. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, it would have. Yeah, I mean, if you if that happened on your own, um, then yeah, I guess it would have been a completely different experience to if you have the lads with you because 
you know, it just makes it a little bit easier if, if you're all in it together and you're all, um, you know, four brains working together is better than one, I guess. Yes. Um, and Will, can you tell us a bit about your service? Yeah, so I joined the Corps in 2009, um, uh, passed out of training 2010 in the summer and joined 4-2, well, yeah, got to 4-2 commando, um, pretty much immediately started pre-deployment training for um, Herrick 14, um, deployed on Herrick 14 with J Company, same company as Junior, um, and yeah, four, mo four months into the tour, I got shot by a sniper um, while I was on patrol. Um, yeah, it was quite a bad injury. It snapped my ulnar bone in my left arm, severed my median nerve, pretty much. It wasn't completely severed, but it was hanging on by a thread, from what I understand. Um, which, so nerve, which, which part of the body is that, mate? Uh, my left forearm. Yeah, um, yeah, it was pretty gnarly. Um, obviously, I had to get Kazovac'd, um, picked up by the American rescue team, Pedro, taken back to Bastion and wheeled into surgery immediately and put to sleep and then uh, woke up and sort of realised what was going on and, you know, realised, you know, it was the end of my tour, um, got flown back to England and then started my recovery I guess that was like the, the pretty much the remainder of my career as a marine was just in in rehab and hospital I think I had six or seven different um operations to try and get the the nerve fixed and the you know everything cleaned up nice. um I think after about a year I got like you know most of the movement back in my hand and it was my injury had recovered as much as it it was going to um I got upgraded went back to work and um, went on a heavy weapons course down in Limpston in the middle of winter and uh, doing all the, all, all the, you know, going through the drills on the guns outside in the cold weather. It just, you know, my, my, my hat, the nerve damage in my hand meant that it, it just, you know, it seizes up, becomes really stiff and my dexterity just goes out the window in the cold weather. So I was unable to, to do the drills correctly on the guns, which meant, I got pulled off the course and then, um, you know, I got put back into rehab and sort of realised this was probably going to be, um, you know, it's not really going to get any better than what it is now. So I could sort of see my career was going to end um, and then eventually got medically discharged in 2013. So it was a bit of a short but intense career for me, I guess. Mm. Did you... Did you fall into a, a do any kind of depression when you left? Because it's it's a big, it's one thing planning to leave the military, and I, I I I had a year and a half of planning, and I still fell on my ass in spectacular style, right? Yeah, took yeah, I think three years to get you know to get back on a horse, so to speak. But you, yours was unplanned, and you and and you've been seriously injured. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, I definitely struggled with with adjusting to being a civvy. Um, I, I do suffer from bouts of depression. Um, I've, I've I've got like a underlying low level anxiety most of the time, um, which I'm trying to work through and stuff. Um, but yeah, it was just. I think it was just a lot in such a small amount of time. For you know, I was only 19 at the time when I was in Afghanistan and. 21 when I left so I was still you know barely an adult really and um trying to figure out how to handle this and how to how to find my place in the world again it was yeah it's been been a bit of a um rocky rocky road um to recovery but you know I'm really grateful for the fact that the lads invited me onto onto the team to to do this crazy expedition with them because it's just been a massive um, boost for me, I guess. Like, you know, after so long not being, you know, I, I'd, I'd sort of cut myself off from a lot of the guys I used to work with and was friends with just out of feelings of um, guilt and, and not feeling worthy of, you know, 
being a you know being a being a bootneck, I guess. Um, so to have this was just a, a massive thing for me um, to be able to do something hoofing again and and represent the core and work with with the lads who we've all got a shared bond, you know. Brilliant. That was going to be my next next question. What did you get out of it? It's uh, yes, hoofing as as you say. Yeah. Nutty, should we come on to you? Can you tell us a bit about your time? Yeah, sure. Um, you're, I joined you're, the... you're still serving? That's right, yeah. Serving in the Lima Company 4-2 Commando. That was, that was my old company. Was it? Yeah, we didn't we didn't have J Company back then, I don't think. And we No? We, was that a fourth company that was added for Afghanistan? It was, originally, it was um, for the Falklands. It was made up of... Um, uh, Clarks, VMs, and things like that, and they put them all together in this one J company. And then uh, after the Falklands, I think they got rid of it, and then it came back again for Afghan, as far as I'm aware. Oh no, Iraq actually, it was it was around in Iraq time. But yeah, no, I'm I'm nutty. I'm 28 years old. Uh, joined the Royal Marines in 2013, and uh, did a heavy weapons anti tank course in 2015. Um, I've been at 4-2 my whole time, so and I, I've really enjoyed it. I've had set up some really good laughs, just been on exercises and things like that. Gone, gone abroad a couple of times. Um, yeah, it's been it's, it's been good, and, and doing this rose, you know, it's been fantastic. Um, what's, it, what's it like for you guys then? Because when I was in, we'd all piled down Union Street, and it was just mental. <laughs> it was just like... Uh, well, hedonist paradise, and this it was a bit like that scene from Star Wars where they go in the bar and you got all the <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you, some of us guaranteed to get laid every night. I'll say some of us, you know, some of us have got it, most haven't, unfortunately, but that's life. Um, you get your kebab, you'd throw up in a taxi and, and, and that was it. That was your night. But there isn't, Union Street's just not happening anymore, is it? Um, probably not like you remember. What did you do? Get on the Bickley bomber from, from 4-2 and, and go <laughs> <laughs> Yes. That, basically, that, yeah, that, that was it. I, I lived, um, I lived ashore, so I... Oh, did you? Yeah, so, and I had, I, I'm, I'm from that area, so I have mates that, you know, we, we get the bus from Yelverton or something like, like <laughs> yeah. that, and then, then get a cab, cab home or, um, yeah, or take a car, not necessarily one that belonged to us, but, mm. yes, interesting, uh, my misspent youth, basically. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just funny when I go down there now. It's almost like desolate. I think you is it Jester's is still there. Oh yeah, sticky Jester's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So oh, sorry, I, I I interrupted you. So you you're still at four two now. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And did you come up um, with the idea for this trip? No, this was this was Brucey. Um, yeah, and he he asked me to do it, and I was like. Absolutely, not a, hes- not a hesitation, not a shadow of a doubt. But we'd done some, uh, we did the devices of Westminster together, um, uh, and previous to that, we were on the same heavy weapons anti tanks course in 2015. So we, we knew each other. And then when Bruce came to 4 2, um, just started grilling in, in the, um, and then just chat- chatting again and having a couple of boozes. And yeah, did the device to Westminster, and it's just gone up from there. So what I'm going to ask you is at what point did you go, right, yeah, I want to do, or, or, or Brucey, at what point did you think, yeah, let's do this, let, let, let's, because you've got to take action, right? And, and it's one thing I'm always saying, probably 99% of people just never take, they, they might have the idea, but they never take action on it, right? But bef- before I ask you that, Brucey, um, Nutty, were you on deployment? I'm, I mean, I'm assuming you were. Uh, what to Afghan or anything like yeah. that? No, I didn't. I didn't do that. Okay. No. I'm just trying to work out where you, where you fit 
where, where you fit into the grand scheme of things. Um, how long are you going to serve for, mate? Are you going to do the 22 or...? or I just uh, take it as it comes at the moment, see, see, how, see how it is. Um, yeah, that's all I can say really about that. And a 42 still going up to Norway? A 42 hasn't gone to Norway for ages. Oh, really? Like as, a, as a whole unit. Yeah. No. Is that what is that just with four five now or something or I think four five. Four five's been over there recently, yeah. Yeah. God, that was an experience back in the day. <laughs> Not a necessarily an easy one when you're bloody 19 years old and carrying a house <laughs> on your back while trying to ski downhill, but hey ho. Yes. <laughs> so Bruce, yes, when um um Brucey, when when did you actually come up with the idea? When did you think, right, let's do this? Uh, on the pitch, we met Dawson down in um, the coach house in Rottendine. Because I filled in for him on, um, someone had to drop out, so I paddled the Yukon with a guy called Neil Marshall. And then uh, we were doing like the post-event boozing up down in um, Rottendine where Mick lives. And he's asked me, how do I feel about rowing an ocean? And I thought, it's an amazing idea, because it never really occurred to me. I didn't even even know what Ocean Road was. Well, I knew Mick had done it, but I never thought about doing it. So we gathered together. Uh, the idea was to mix two serving uh, royal with two former royal in the boat. And so, um, yeah, that's what happened. The approach night because we raced together, and he's a demon in the kayak, and fit as hell. So it's like he's the first person I would have imagined asking. The um, the Yukon. Uh, is it a race it, or, or just a paddle? So, yeah, there's a few events on the Yukon. We did the 444, which is the River Quest, 444 mile race from Whitehorse to Dawson. We, it's a, lot, a bit shorter than the other events on the same river, but um, it's a lot more intense. Like, you do it in one hit. Yeah. Is that the one Foxy did? Oh, uh, no, I think he paddled from source to sea. Like, he walks a bit of the, I can't remember what it's called, it's like the Chinook Trail or something. And then when the river's paddleable, he's, he paddled the full length for the, what was it, the Bering Sea or something? The Beaufort Sea, somewhere in Alaska, anyway. I bumped into him out in Whitehorse as well, actually. Did he try and borrow money off you? <laughs> nah, he was pretty sorted. <laughs> so, um, let's go back to Junior then. Um, how did you get the boat together? How does that work? Do you buy one? Do you have it made? Uh, well, so, um, the, 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 I think like you can buy them, have them made, uh, you, you can yeah, buy them secondhand, have them made or, or rent them. Um, but luckily, uh, for, like through Brucey, um, uh, Mick Dawson and, and Chris Martin, um, they really looked after us and re really, really looked after us and sorted us out with a, with a, really good deal on the boat and the equipment um but it can be really really expensive it is still really expensive but they really looked after us can you give um, us a rough idea mate how much the gear cost uh i think i yeah i think from never rowing an ocean in your life and know nothing about ocean rowing having no kit equipment boat um no training um to get all the qualifications you need and stuff i think you could be talking um, 100 grand to 150 grand. Um, I don't know, Brucey, am I right there when I say that? Do you think? Yeah, for sure, mate. A lot of people yeah. recover a bit of cost afterwards by selling the boat. But if you buy the boat and all the kit, yeah, you're looking well upwards of 100 grand. Yeah. So, but as I was saying, then we, we just got really lucky. We had some really, really good people um, helping us along the way. And, and also, Brucey. The nutty's still been serving. Um, we, we managed to get some help from the actual Royal Marines or, and, and the Royal Marines charity, as Brucey's representing right now with a T-shirt. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we had some really, really good support behind us and we managed to make it happen for just a fraction of the price. Yes. Uh, Brucey, just back to you. I didn't mm -hmm. ask you about your service. How long have you been in? Uh, seven years or eight years now? Eight years. Yeah. Eight years, yeah. I joined in um, 2013. 
And then, what was that, 17 or something, did a pass as Norway. And then a few exercises, but well, they were quite far around the globe apart from the Orient. Did you say you have been around the globe or you haven't? I have, but not on any like um, deployments of action like Afghanistan or anything, just like Black Alligator in the States and stuff like that. Mm. Um, sorry, I've got to think of the question I was just about to ask. Yes. So if we go back to, to Will, um, Will, what's it like pushing away from the, the side, setting off? Um, quite strange, really, because we just set off from um, um, a port in Gran Canaria, uh, Puerto Rico, which is just, you know, like a really nice sort of marina, loads of nice yachts and stuff. Um, and we were there for a little while, um, obviously doing some final bits of work on the boat. Um, like we stored it there um, on land for a couple of weeks while we like packed all the food. And as we were doing that, we sort of had a lot of people passing by and, you know, asking us questions about what we're doing and um, people really interested in it. So when we set off, we had sort of a, quite a nice crowd of um, friends that we'd, that we'd made in the, in the weeks leading up to setting off. Um, but yeah, like Junior said, it was a beautiful day um, when we set off and we were excited to, to get off into some nice, you know, perfect rowing conditions, which we did for the first few hours. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was a bit strange because obviously, you know, we get on the boat and, and, and then, take our shoes off and that's the last time we're going to be stood on land until we get to the other side of the world pretty much which is yeah it's a strange thing to think about but um yeah we were just all excited to get started because you know it'd been so long in the making um our pacific plan had had gone out the window due to the virus um we had a load of obstacles to to get over so we should mention that, mate, shouldn't we? That you were gonna, you were, you were entering a race that originally was across the Pacific. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna take take part in a Great Pacific race, which was due to set off in July, June or July last year, I think. Um, but yeah, obviously with COVID, it, it, it got canned. So, um, so yeah, we just we we, we put our heads together and, and came up with the Atlantic crossing um which sort of worked out all right it worked out really well to be honest um because we had a lot more time to train for it and get things organized um and raise more money so and um yeah. i'm guessing you you guys know kale do you yeah 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 he's he's a bit of a legend in the old rowing isn't he former sol yes. soldier for our fr friends at home that, that we, we all know, Kale Royce. Um, wasn't he going to row, or isn't he's planning to row the uh, the Pacific as a, as a double double amputee? Well, I, I haven't spoken to Kale in a little while. Um, I can't remember the last time I said to Kale, but um, he, he's probably up to something mental. Yeah. <laughs> something <laughs> What? Kind of drag Frank into it, probably. Yes. Frank, uh... So, um, how long would it take to to row the Pacific? That must take months. Uh, I think uh, we we weren't planning on rowing the whole Pacific. We we're planning on rowing from San Francisco to Hawaii, which I think would probably, Bruce, you may correct me now, uh, uh, around a similar time period, really, and a similar distance. So. It's slightly shorter, but um, it's harder, right? You got the cold weather coming down past San Fran that from the Arctic, so it's fucking Baltic. It's about two twenty four hundred nautical miles, but at the same time, yeah. Wow. Have you guys read um, or even seen? There's a film out now, um, the Contiki Expedition. No. No. Oh, is that a rowing? Is that a rowing expedition? No, it's actually a raft expedition. It was Tor Heyerdahl, um, a Norwegian chap, basically led a, a team of uh, former Norwegian commandos, I suppose you'd say, um, from Chile across to um, Polynesia. 
he was trying to prove an age old theory about migration in, you know, in pre not prehistoric, but in, in ancient times. And how far is that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the map now. It's, it's, it's a good few thousand miles, put it that way, two, oh, two, no. if not two, if not three, if not more. Um, but it was mental. All these guys had been up there in Norway in the resistance fighting Germans, and they they were they were full on and mental, you know. Did they complete the expedition? Say again. They successfully completed it. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the guys was in an OP above a post office, and it was something like five Germans came in and he fell through the floor or, so, or the <laughs> ceiling or something, he just yeah. pulled, pulled his pistol out and shot these five guys dead. Right. This is, this is the kind of, can I say caliber of these men. Right. And um, his name was, I think his name was Torsten Rabbi. And when Tor Heyerdahl sent him a telegram to say, I'm in South America, I'm building a balsa wood raft, <laughs> gonna sail the Pacific. Um, are you in? Torsten messes back on my way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just, I love that. That I just love that. No nonsense. Oh, I'm in, right? So, yes, yes. Um, should, we, should we plan? Um... So we plan a similar expedition ourselves right now. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> you know, I I would love to have recreate that expedition, but his grandson actually did it. Um, there's there's very few of those big balsa wood trees left in the world now. They've all oh, been, Jim. you know, the, you you need you need sort of ancient ones that have been growing for a fair few years to get the and the the raft they made was huge. It was probably about. Oh, God. What's that for? About 50 metres long or something. It was it was enormous. Um, really good book. Anybody watching, it's in it's in my um, Amazon shop. There's a link link below the um, Contiki expedition. One of the best books I've ever, ever read. I've read loads of rafting books. Um, but yes. Anyway, back to the rowing. Um, how long was it before someone flashed? Um, <laughs> not too long. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Junior was flashing before he even set off. I think. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm I'm one for I do like a good flash every five minutes or so. I'm actually due, I'm actually due another one now, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. My, my, my flash is my flashes are harmless. They may not sound harmless, but outsider. But I, I, I flash a lot. Will will probably know me the longest here, and he knows I like a good flash. But you know, everyone knows I, I love them. Uh, but I do like a good flash every now and then. So um, I'm just going to chuck some questions out, fellas, and just add, let's just do these. Um, just just off the top of your head, sort of thing. So, can everyone give me their high point and High point and low point. Start with junior. Uh, high point. Right. So yeah, yeah there's. Oh, that's so probably an e that's probably an easy one, isn't it? It's getting ashore. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, on the actual row itself. I had quite a few high points. Um, uh, yeah, in the first couple weeks, I well, know it's a few weeks in, but for the first few weeks, we could see hundreds and hundreds of shooting stars every every hour it was, it was insane just so many um uh but there was this one night where it was a, a full moon the stars were out the moon was shining across a flat sea um the bioluminescence as we were rowing through it was lighting up green about a foot either side of the boat we had a pot of dolphins following us that night um tuna fish following us that night and we had a whale following us for three days, and that whale was following us on the same night as well, just circling around us, popping its head up. Um, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that was that was one. Yeah, that was one of my high points at night. Was just magic with all the stars, the shooting stars, the dolphins, the tuna fish, the whale, the bioluminescence. It was amazing. 
Uh, one of my low points was um, we had pretty much the same through the whole way across. We had one set menu using um, dehydrated de- dehydrated rations, uh, freeze dry, um, freeze dry rations. And there was one meal in there, and particularly one one meal, which was chicken noodles, where it would take fucking forty five minutes for the um <laughs> the water to soak into the noodles. So it's like chewing on it's like chewing on concrete. And uh, we tried to mix up mix up to make sure everyone would get like the, a chicken curry, a chicken tikka. And we had the, we had chicken with every meal, main meal. And there was one day. Will, there was one day Will give me chicken noodles three days on the fucking bounce and I wanted to rip his head off. I was like, well, um, and I was like, Will, you give me fucking chicken noodles again? He's like, I thought, I thought you liked it, mate. You asked for it the other day. And I said, I asked for it because I didn't, I thought I hadn't had it in a few days. So I asked for it so everyone else could have a nice meal. And he gave me it three days on the bounce, and I was fucking fuming. I was fuming. <laughs> Even lost half. I've lost half a tooth at the back there as well from chewing on them fucking noodles. But yeah, that was that was a real low point. That was a real low point. <laughs> <laughs> what um what brand were the were the rations? Did you get like a Pusser's brand, or were they a shop a shop yeah. bought one? They were, they were pussers. Uh, Brucey and Natty managed to sort the food out through pasta. Oh, man, I, don't know, I don't know how much we can. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much, I don't can know say how much we can say about this. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right <laughs> at the start of the expedition, if me and Natty had, um, the, well, the four of us, we've got all the four of us, but by this point, there was fuck all we could do. We were frantically trying to raise money. We we're like, right, let's get some food. <laughs> so we put in an order for, um, we had, how long will it take? Let's get three months each. So we had a year's worth of Norway rations, like repack boxes. It was like four grams worth of scrap. And, I, and it wasn't officially given to us. So I don't know if I can. <laughs> well, it's out there now. I hope, we don't, I hope we don't catch that on it. Yeah. <laughs> How the hell have we got fucking one year's rations from Norway? How many went to Norway? It's like quick, bring the band on <laughs> uh, You're not a true Royal Marine if you don't prof stuff. That's just, that's just the way it is. Yeah, the name true. of the storm and not all the big was. was. <laughs> <laughs> Smudge. <laughs> Will, over to you. High point, low point, or most scared point, what, however you want to put it. Um, yeah, high point, I guess. We've talked about that, that night that Junior just mentioned quite a lot. Um, but I guess like just, just rowing at night when it was nice, when it was like calm weather and... Um, all the stars were out. We had uh, Bluetooth speakers on the boat for the first couple of weeks before our Spotify accounts wrapped their tits in. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm into my like sort of psychedelic, spacey, electronic, <laughs> ambient music, um, which, uh, which the other lads weren't too too keen on, but I enjoyed it. But like I put it on at night and uh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, just, I thought I was like looking into my nose at one point. I was like, Why has it gone a wonk? <laughs> yeah, so I put that on when I when me and Junior rode at night because Junior enjoyed it a little bit. Um, yeah, I did. and yeah, it was just it was just crazy like rowing through, through you know, in the middle of the ocean, you got all the stars reflecting off the sea, the moonlight, you know, lighting up the path we're going down. Um, and you know, just looking at the stars, I guess, and just thinking what well, you know what the hell are we doing we're in the middle of nowhere and um yeah it's just quite a surreal experience um and having that music just made it better for me anyway was it good just getting back to nature and having all the clutter of modern life out the way and, and just experiencing that that pureness yeah 100 yeah, percent it was a yeah a beautiful experience i guess um yeah just like you know your head's way you know way clearer because you've got the only thing you've got to worry about is what's going on in the boat and what your your mission is i guess um you don't have to worry about you know anything going on back home your usual worries of life just go yeah they get left ashore so that's why i love going away is the second you get on the road or you get on the plane or what or on your bike whatever it is 
like life, all the worries, they're behind you. You, you. It's just brilliant. It's probably why I traveled so much. Yes. Yeah, so, everything's just, it's just life simple, isn't it? Like, yes, it is. This, what, what this is now, whatever this clusterfuck is, this, for young people watching, this ain't life. I'm sorry to say it the way it is. It's a fucking shit show. All, the yeah. whole lot of it. You know, taking, I just spent six weeks when I've got one of the biggest podcasts in the UK, six weeks trying to set up an email server, right? <laughs> six weeks every day. That, that, to me, that ain't life. That ain't living. It's, it's, it's just getting worse as, as we go on. And um, yeah, I don't think it's uh, the population that, that the population in general that benefits off all this crap. Brucey, over to you, mate. What um, high and low point? Oh, high and low point. <laughs> yeah, what's, that? what's that? We will. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I agree. I agree with what Will says about uh, some of those nights. It's just thoroughly enjoyable, right? Yes. That is just a serene experience, and you know? like it's amazing. Then the low point probably come within the first few days when we were looking at multiple different weather models, consulting a lot of experience, like much more than us experienced ocean rowers. And then we were walking down the jetty and this fisherman was coming off his boat, he was like 70 years old, lived a life at sea, like what the fuck's he know, right? And he was like, oh, you're leaving tomorrow, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah. I, was like, oh, I wouldn't do that if I was you. I'm like, yeah, fucking hell, what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> then, then, <laughs> then we got here, man, it's mad. Like, one of the biggest storms we experienced still within sight of land, right? <laughs> I was just looking at night on the shift, like, because we weren't used to the routine, the changeovers, getting scrum on and shit like that. It was just carnage for about three days, mate. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, but like Junior says earlier, it's better to have a storm sooner rather than later because it gives us confidence in the boat and ourselves. Yes. Good. Rather than have the first storm halfway across, where it's a little bit more remote. Nutty, over to you, mate. What high point, low point? My point was um, having a cold, crisp pint in Barbados. <laughs> no. uh, the high point was um, <clears throat> seeing the whale go underneath the boat uh, when it was it was so close. You know, it's about six to eight feet away, um, and it just it just went underneath the boat, and it was spectacular. You could see it in the moonlight. That was truly amazing. And then low point probably was. Um, when we hit a storm, sort of like, no, it wasn't really a storm. It was just like a bad patch of weather. The current was going in the wrong direction. The wind was going in the wrong direction and the waves were going in the wrong direction. And it was heartbreaking to just be like, not moving anywhere. Uh, yeah, I, that, I wasn't very happy about that. I bet, because it took you, what, what, what was it, 49 days? 49 days, 19 hours and 45 minutes. Is that any kind of record? <laughs> Is... No. Oh, so you're a bit shit then, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you did you swim a lot? Did you hop over the side, or did you think about sharks all the time? We got a bit a... at one point. It was, it was flat as hell in the middle. It was like a mill pond for a week, and then we were swimming off the boat, and that was like not even that close to the boat. But there was no real safety concerns because it it was flat as hell, you know. Good. 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 Yeah, we had to get off the boat to clean it every every week or so. Spread oh, the, the, the barnacles and stuff. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Did you get any fish following you? In in and did you sort of develop an ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, I think I'm pretty sure the tuna fish follow this the whole way to Barbados, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, they had a holiday as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did did, yeah. did yeah. you? Stupid question time. But did you do any fishing? We we didn't need to. They jumped uh, on the boat. Well, no, yeah, it, we were chucking flying fish off by the hundreds every <laughs> night and in the morning, yeah. But we didn't eat any. We were just feeding the tuna fish and feeding the seagulls. And uh, there was there was one flying fish that makes me laugh like so much. I was rowing along and it it hurtled into <laughs> Brucey's back and ricocheted into the water, and it was so funny. I, I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was hitting with such 
So um, I've got two final questions. Um, so the second to last question is when you hit uh, Barbados, did you go to Nelson Street? Oh, I don't, uh, where, where is that? Sorry. <laughs> where is it? It's like the roughest street in Barbados. It's when you go there as ship's company. I was on, on Invince for a year. It's like the first place everybody goes because it's, it's um, yeah, let's just say one night in um, Nelson Street makes the hard men tumble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, when we got there, they had a strict curfew and then a lockdown kicked in, what, within a few days, Bruce, you know, was it? Yeah, about that, about that. We was really fortunate because there was a, a guy that if, I think he found out about us about a week before we hit land called Tony Trulin. Who's a, he's a um, army commandos legend from Five Nine. Top guy. And he's yeah. he's been right over here like doing security on um, rich people's pads, and he puts in his contracts when they're not there he can use them for his own ends. So we're staying in these mansions and that, which is really nice. Living the dream. And Will, over to you just for my final um, question, mate. What's it like when you spot land and, and you know that's it, you've done it? Um, yeah, it's a, obviously a great feeling. Um, don't really realise what it's like to, to not be around any sort of life um, and land for that amount of time. So when when we spotted it, it was, a, it was good to know that we... We're within striking distance of it, um, especially because the weeks, the couple of weeks leading up to it was like Nutty said, we, you know, the the elements were just against us pretty much the whole way. So, well, for the for the last little leg of it, anyway. Um, so yeah, it was good to see it and and know that it was it was soon going to be over, especially for me, just because I was in so much pain from my um, my bum injury. Um, I had all these craters, like little holes that started off as boils and then they burst and then just my, my ass was just peppered with, with, with holes. So it was just agony to sit down. So for me, I was like, Oh yes, yeah, soon I'm not going to have to sit on this seat for 12 hours a day. So that was a good feeling. Yeah. Did you take sort of a serious med kit with you? Yeah, we did. We had a, um, yeah, we had all the stuff we could, we could need, I guess. Um, so yeah, I was taking, I did take a course of antibiotics, which cleared it up. Um, and during the, the period in the middle where it was nice weather and we weren't getting getting smashed by the by the waves and getting wet all the time, it sort of cleared up a little bit. But then, you know, as we got closer to the Caribbean, um, we were getting wet a lot more, um, a lot more waves coming over the boat. So it just sort of flared up again and then just became almost unbearable. Awful. Right, to finish off, um, we got a lot of people out there, not just our brothers and sisters in the military, but I think after this current situation, a lot of people are going to be struggling with their mental health um, or to just young people in general that are like, Chris, I want to fucking get out and smash life. What, what, you know, what, what how do I start? Can, can we all give one tip? something we maybe do in our lives or the way we approach an adventure. Just if we could all give one um, tip each, I'll start. Don't listen to the naysayers because you'll get a lot of them. Everyone will try and talk you out your dreams, except the people that genuinely like care about you and want the best of you and believe in you. Um, if I listen to the naysayers, I <laughs> probably wouldn't have done fuck all in my life. And I've, I've had to listen to them so much now over uh, traveling through 85 countries um, that it, it doesn't bother me now because I just know it's, I know anytime you announce you're going to do something a bit mad, they're all going to come out of the woodwork. So that would be my tip. Don't listen to the naysayers. Will, got something for us? Um, yeah, I guess everyone sort of knows like has a, 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 a sort of idea about stuff they could be doing that if they did do it would make their life better um so something that's helped me is like you know try and like you know maybe like write down 
everything that you can think of that would make your life better that you're not doing um and also write down the things that you are doing that aren't serving you um and then just work away at that that list and try and bring in like new new habits and like good ways of thinking and and you know attack it slowly because if you try and do it all at once you know you're just bound to fail so just get like get some good new habits like ingrained in and and discard the ones that aren't serving you and fit and like, like like you said about the, the naysayers just like feed off it um you know if someone tells me i can't do something it makes me more more hungry to want to do it legendary thanks will Brucey sat there going, fucking hell, I can't think of anything. <laughs> 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 Have you got something for us, Brucey? Yeah, there's, there's very little actually between you and what you want to do. A lot of restraints are self-imposed. Like, if you just get out, there, get out there and start doing it. Spot on. Take, take action. Nutty? Yeah, take every opportunity that arises and... and um... Go at it. Classic. Junior, the last um, words we eat. Yeah, so have we got another hour, have we? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, I like to visualise things and, um, and manifest things. Um, so as soon as, uh, as soon as Brucey approached me with the opportunity, I had a clear... I had a clear, I could visualise it clearly. I could visualise myself in Barbados having a pint on the beach and I didn't really think about the stuff in between um, too much. So I, did, I could visualise myself there. I felt like it had already happened in my mind. But also have have the, just have the bigger picture in mind all the time, a clear vision of what you want. But um, just chip away at it. Just take small steps to get there. And that's exactly what we did as a team. Every day we were doing something different, working towards our working towards our goal. And before we knew it, um, we were on the start line. So have your clear, your, a clear visualization in your head of what you want to achieve, and then just chip away at the small things. And before you know it, you'll be there, and it will all be over. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I found when I when I ran the length for the country. Uh, I'm stood on the start line at John O'Groats. I've got a 15 kilo backpack on and I've got to run an ultra marathon every day. I didn't know how many I'd have to run, but it ended up being 36. And I thought, I'm going to see my little boy. That's all I thought. I thought about arriving at Land's End and there's my little boy and we're going to, we're going to run the last 100 metres together. And that was it. That's what I did. I, and the beauty of that, making that decision there and then, was I didn't have to worry about fuck all then. I never had a single negative thought. Even when I got badly injured, I was still just focused on... Oh, hang on a sec. Hello, Mum. Yeah. Yeah, I'm eating well. Yeah, yeah, I'm washing behind my ears. Love you too. Hugs. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, just people listen. It's called begin with the end in mind, right? You're getting to the end. You visualize it like Junior says. Fuck all is going to stop you or put you off. At least not the naysayers. And the great thing about that is you just shed all the worry then and you can get into the experience and, and just enjoy each and every moment. Fellas, massive, massive thank you. Um, very proud of you all. I'm sure that, the, the, well, I know the whole of the core is. I'm going to put a link below. Is your fundraiser still open? Yeah. Yeah, Chris, I was, I was going to ask you to take this opportunity right at the end. If everyone likes what they've heard, just um, go on Google and find the RM Charity and just chuck them a fiver or something. Because they yeah. do a lot of good stuff out there at the moment, especially. Yes. So, friends at home, I'll put a link below the video. Even if you can spare a fiver. In fact, when I do my challenges, I only ask people to give a fiver because everyone giving a fiver is better than just a few people giving a lot. So, please uh, try and do that. Um, 
Fellas, if you just stay on the line so I can thank you properly, but I'm going to thank you now on behalf of the, the camera. So massive thank you all and congratulations. Um, to our friends at home, if you could like and subscribe, then we're going to get more of this these uh, brilliant podcasts to you. Uh, life-changing podcasts, I would say, because I don't think anyone tells the truth as much as, as we do. And uh, yes, that's a rare thing in, in this day and age. So that's it. Massive love to you all. Take care. Cheers, Cheers. Chris. Cheers, Cheers Chris.